I like whoever just signed in with their emoji. Karen. Hi, Katrina. Good to see you. Awesome. You too. I'm here. Katrina, are you up at school? You're like, I can't tell if you're in your office. I'm at home and I was just telling my husband that I need to get another camera because um, it's always like, it's super bright in here, but you can't tell because of where I am. Yeah. I don't know, but no, I'm at home. I realized yesterday I was on some video call and I was like looking at, you know, the screen and I realized that there was all this stuff on the table behind me and it was like stuff that like, we've just been piling up. I was like, how have I not noticed that people are just staring at my clutter for the past like four months? So good for me to get on top of that. All right. How are we doing? We're at 32. Yeah, it's slowed down a little bit. So if we want to get started, I think people will probably trickle in. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll we'll have a we'll have a slide of intro anyway. So hopefully we have a couple of more people joining. So, hey, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Jumpstart Your School Garden webinar. And um, just uh, wanted to kind of start with a couple of um, housekeeping things. Perfect. Thank you. So um, of course, mute your microphone. Um, I know. At some point, I'm sure my dog is going to bark. There's always kind of background noise, but whatever we can do to minimize that, we'll try to do that. Um, we have our, if you guys will just plan, if you have questions along the way, we want to hear your questions. And so just type them in the chat box. And since there's three of us, we're going to be kind of monitoring that chat. And we've got stops along the way during the presentation to address questions. So if there's anything absolutely urgent, you know, unmute and ask it. But otherwise, we'll just sort of have our little pit stops to ask some of the questions. Um, we are going to have a, t a time where we'll have breakout rooms and we'll be breaking out to like, you know, groups of like from your specific school. And then we have some if it's like a real small group from your school or if you're the only one, we may just kind of pair you up or group you up with some other folks that are also um, singles. And so, you know, we're going to have specific tasks during that time. There'll be about probably like a 10 minute breakout. Um, and then um, CPE credit and certificates, we're so happy to offer that for this class. Um, and so, you know, obviously like you must be present and active to win. We want you guys to be active in those breakout rooms, but those will, you'll see those come out after. We'll send them to you um, via email. And in regards to, I just wanted to touch on um, those of you who are in our UT programs. I know you're not all in them, but um, we're not going to go super in depth about what's happening with our programs because we have kind of a mixed group here. But you should have either already gotten some email email communication, or you will be getting email communication about what's happening with those programs. So don't worry. But of course, you can always contact us directly if you have questions about that. So all right, let's get started. So I just want to first um, introduce our presenters today. So um, Katie, Michelle, and I all work at UT. And we, um, some of you guys might know us from the Texas Sprouts program. For those of you who don't know about Texas Sprouts, it was a research program that's actually now concluded and is in the analysis phase. But the, the focus of that study was studying how school gardens affect obesity measures in elementary age kids and their family. So there's some really great results that are coming out of that, but that was a five-year um, study and um, with 16 schools. So a lot of you guys are at schools that we actually worked with. And like we said, it's so good to see you again. Um, Katie and I now work on a program called Sprouting Teachers. And Sprouting Teachers, um, we'll talk more about these programs later, but that's working kind of directly with teachers in the schools. And then Michelle is um, faculty at UT and teaches an undergrad course that is connected into the UT intern preceptor program where actually our UT undergrads are working with elementary age teachers. So we're psyched to be here today. All right, so I thought we'd just kind of start by acknowledging where we are. We were just kind of laughing about sort of like no shame for how your garden is looking. Um, I realize that some of you guys may have actually just seen your garden for the first time since spring break when we asked you to go take pictures. And I know it's probably a little bit jarring. Um, summer is normally a tough time and the quarantine has actually, I mean, has obviously made it even worse for, up, for upkeep of the garden. So, you know, normally you've got these seeds going on and you've got in the spring and the early summer, we actually had kind of a unusual amount of rain 
um, in the early summer. And then we had no gardeners to take care of any of the weeds. And your school garden is sort of right in the middle of this storm. So we all acknowledge that and it doesn't make it any easier that our quarantine is kind of continuing and we're not able to get up there and have a huge work day. But we are here to help, hopefully. All right. So I wanted to jump into some challenges, talking about challenges that we normally face. So, you know, forget about the pandemic and everything, but this is just normal challenges that we have to overcome. So, you know, your schools are owned and maintained by your school district. And what happens is that school gardens are just typically kind of left out of that sort of arrangement. And they're just frequently left up to the school or to perhaps like a smaller subset of the school, a committee, um, sometimes even part of the PTA or a parent volunteer group to handle. So there's always this question of sort of like, whose job is it? Um, and it inevitably gets kind of left up to volunteers either from the staff or from parents. Um, the garden is, doesn't necessarily belong to any one person, and I'm not advocating that it should ever really belong to one person, but there's not ever really that one person that feels like, rarely, let me say, is there that one person that they are paid and their job is to make sure that the garden is maintained. So we've looked at a lot of data across Austin schools, and as you guys can guess, it is pretty rare to have someone who that's their full paid position. Um, so usually what happens is it falls to a group to share responsibility and work together. And right now, that's just not a great uh, area that we can really focus on. We can't have those groups going up there. So it becomes even harder. And finally, you know, I know when I, when my front yard is not mowed, like whenever I go up to my, go to my drive up to my house, I'm like, oh my God, my front yard's not mowed. Like everyone's looking at it. It's much easier with the school to just be like, oh, I'm not looking at that garden, especially during the summer. So it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, which all these things on top of each other kind of build. So I wanna jump into our top trouble areas and just give you guys a little sense of, you know, what we know are the challenges, but maybe give you a few more details to help you understand how, to, how you can help minimize those challenges. So for weeds, you know, the big thing right now is, I could, I could safely guess that weeds are probably the number one problem in every school garden if you went up and took pictures of your garden. So right now, the problem with weeds are that the longer you wait, the bigger the challenge is because those weeds are all seeding out. And you can tell between, you know, spring break and now really, you're really seeing a lot of seeds on the weeds right now. So the reason why regularly scheduled maintenance is important is because that's happening. So if you have those regularly scheduled maintenance days, even if it's not like big group work days, but it's kind of smaller groups going in or families going in, something like that, classes, it tends to proactively take care of those problems um, rather than having a look and see approach where you're like, oh, let me just check to see if it's a problem. Because usually by the time it gets to the point where you're like, that's a big problem, you're already sort of on the other side of the problem where the seeds are already dropping out. Um, it's easy to not prioritize just because, you know, again, you're not living with it. I would recommend that, you know, there, right now it becomes problematic because I know I was just out in, in uh, an area weeding the other day and with the heat and the lack of rain, you know, you have areas like decomposed granite that really starts to feel like concrete. So, um, when you are weeding, you're really going to have to um, either, you know, you can soften it with water. Obviously, if we get rain, I know there's a, some in the forecast, that's a great time to go out and be able to pull those weeds a little bit easier. So I want to talk about a couple of like, I call these like the top celebrity weeds. These are the ones that you see usually and tell you a little bit about them so you'll understand why they become so problematic. So the first one I want to talk about is spurge. And spurge is the one if you've been in your garden and you've seen these like large mats of um, weeds growing and you can sort of like gather them up like a ponytail and they have like one little taproot in the center. So you can see in these pictures there's sort of like an area right in the center where the cursor is. That's where it kind of goes in right there. Now seeds will develop all over this plant. So if you let it seed out, what's going to happen is not only do you have that large plant, but in future seasons, you're going to have a whole bunch of little plants in, in, the, in the future, and it doesn't necessarily start to feel like mats anymore because there's so many of them. 
So these can be really easy to remove. Um, you definitely want to get the tap root, um, but you definitely want to kind of gather them up. And especially now, as you look at those pictures, you see those little dots on them. Those are all the seeds. So literally a thousand seeds can come off a plant. So you definitely, as you start to remove those, having a bag or a container close by, don't just kind of like toss them. I, you know, a lot of times I'll like kind of make a pile of weeds, but what happens when they have seeds on them is that you toss them on that pile and the seeds will fall off during, as you're tossing them and as you're picking them up again. So getting them like right into a container to contain those seeds is important. Um, definitely on these, you know, softening the gravel is a big help, um, especially if they are growing in the decomposed granite and soil, it's a lot easier to get them out. All right, so nutgrass. Nutgrass is like the sneaky weed because basically it's got this little, you can see in that picture where they're kind of joined together, those little nuts that are right at the end of the root. Um, the leaf of the nutgrass is sort of slick and glossy and that ends up protecting it from a lot of herbicides. So people will try to spray and be like, I don't understand why Roundup's not killing them. And it's because it almost has a coating on it that stops it a lot of times from soaking that herbicide in. So here's the crazy thing about it. Those little nuts can form three different plants and then each of those little plants will form a nut and then it goes three seeds. It's like that like horrible like hair care commercial about the shampoo or you know she told three people and she told three people. So they tend to kind of just be all like daisy chained together. Now kids will come out when you're weeding with them and they love to pull these things and they'll just pull it and the nut stays right in the ground. So the nut will just end up sort of growing three more plants. So it's really important here when you are doing, um, when you're really trying to get this stuff out, is to use a good tool and to actually kind of dig in there softly. They're connected by a little bare root. So just kind of digging in softly and then make it a challenge about seeing, you know, if you're working with kids, I love challenging them to find if they can get that daisy chain of weeds. Um, but as an adult too, when you're weeding, try to really like follow the line and see where it goes to so you can get that nut out. I have one more picture here of the nut grass and this is up from uh, Pearl. If there's anyone on Pearl here, you know, you are not alone in, the, in suffering from this, but you know, you look at this picture and you're probably like, oh, that doesn't look bad. That's just like a little bit of nut grass. But what you don't see is that it's probably already gone out in under that mulch and it's forming new plants under that mulch. So you really do kind of have to follow to see how far it's gotten into the dirt. All right, and so our last celebrity weed is crabgrass. Crabgrass kind of does exactly what you see here. It spreads outward rapidly and it likes to drop its seeds kind of beyond the mother plant so that the new plants won't be competing with the mother plant. It also has a tap root that's actually pretty significant. So a lot of times you'll sort of ponytail it up and pull and it just, the branches start breaking off and you don't have that tap root. So again, this plant, you know, all the ends of those branches that you're seeing have seeds on them. So it can produce thousands of seeds. But just making sure you have a tool to really get underneath and kind of dig and get that tap root out is important. All right, so for weeding, I just wanna say a couple of tips. Um, I talked about regularly scheduled maintenance. And you know, I would say kind of the primary season for having that maintenance is like March through November. Um, and yes, that does include the summer, unfortunately. So one of the things, just at that last tip I wanted to kind of jump to is that getting your summer helpers lined up before school is out can really help with your garden. Um, a lot of times if you have a vegetable garden, you might kind of bribe getting volunteers by saying that during the week that they're actually helping out in the garden, they can have excessive, they, they basically have harvesting rights in the garden. Um, but when you are able to kind of line that up, it makes it a lot less stressful on you as garden leaders in your school. And you can kind of leave it up to whoever's volunteering to be able to take care of it with just minimal sort of checking in from the person who's um, handling that volunteer core. And then the other tip I wanted to just make here, I, I showed this picture um, because I think it's a great idea to have these kind of communication um, vehicles at your garden. So this is just a you know, homemade chalkboard that was put up in this garden and they're able to write down garden chores. Now, I mean, you could have garden chore and like weeding, weeding, weeding is basically your chore. But if there are specific things that need to be done, 
or things that one volunteer needs to communicate to the next maintenance volunteer, this makes it a little bit easier for that communication to be passed along. So just a little idea for you guys. All right, so our next challenge that we see a lot in school gardens is overgrown plants. And I will say that I am kind of guilty of being at times an emotional gardener. If something is alive, I'm like, oh my God, I can't possibly just like throw it out. But in fact, that's a really important point is that just because it's alive doesn't mean that it belongs there or that's a good spot there. So having overgrown plants in your beds you end up starting to get kind of some of the similar problems that weeds bring in is you have, you know, those plants can seed out and you'll end up having like, while having one or two of the plants was great, but having like a thousand of them is not great. They can also introduce a lot of bugs if they start to have health problems or just attract a certain type of bug. And they just become a bigger cleanup problem later. So I've seen this a lot in school gardens where like something green comes up and everyone's like, oh, it's a plant. I wonder what it is. I wonder what it is. And no one wants to pull it out because it's green. Well, like five years later, they realize that that was actually an acorn that sprouted. And now there's a tree growing in a vegetable bed. So again, you just have to really be aware of like, what did you intentionally put there? What is like a surprise seeding, which sometimes can be pleasant and sometimes that surprise seating is not in an appropriate location and needs to be pulled out. All right, so this is an example from uh, Carver. So Carver peeps, shout out to you. Um, this is a great little, they have a native area up there. And I remember when I first saw the Carver native area, I loved it because they have fennel up there, which is one of my favorites and it's a fantastic plant to have for to attract a certain type of butterflies. Um, so fennel is a lot of fun, but fennel also loves to seed out. So what you're seeing here, all these tall plants are fennel plants and they're dropping seeds all over. So can you just go to the next slide, Michelle? So this is on the other side of where I was taking the picture before. And you can see that now the fennel plants have actually spread into the classroom area, the seating area, a whole nother bed. So while fennel is, again, it's fun to have in certain quantities, there is, there's a point where you want to say, you know, we don't need any more fennel. And I had that with like one of my first gardens that I worked with where there was like a cilantro outbreak that was like crazy. It was everywhere. It was literally like a lawn of cilantro. So just be aware of when it's time to say goodbye to a plant. Okay. So now talking about soil, you know, um, Soil is, can be a challenge here because of our hot weather. And then in addition, you know, plants will just naturally take up nutrition from a soil. Um, so we tend to have the nutrition in soil of, you know, it's really important for plants, obviously, but it just naturally depletes over time. So I want you guys to think of soil as like, it's like a, a almost like a sourdough starter, if you've ever like used that. It's like you have to just kind of keep like feeding it and adding to it to make it really work for you. So really important there are like seasonal amendments of compost. It's, compost is always good to add to your soil. It adds organic matter, it adds nutrients. You can see in the pictures on the right that we've got a, a soil on top that's a very clay-based soil. It's very cracked up, it looks very hard. Um, and then at the bottom is a much more pliable soil and you can see the earthworms in it. It just feels like it's got a lot more in it. So that's really what you're going towards. And it doesn't mean that that top picture or the clay, like you don't necessarily need to like dig it all out and get it out, but you amend it to sort of transform that soil over time. Um, another thing that helps a lot with soil is adding that top layer of mulch on top and leaving it as a layer on top. That both helps with hindering weed growth and also it naturally decomposes into the soil. So typically you're adding like a minimum of about two inches of mulch and that's what you want in the bottom most layer of that is naturally decomposing into the soil and adding organic matter and the top part it you know helps keep moisture in there and stops those weeds or hinders those weeds from growing because the weeds are incredible at where they'll grow. You know, I, we, we get asked questions about, do we need to add like fertilizer applications and all that kind of stuff. If, if you're having some major 
plant health issues, which a lot of times you'll mainly see this in vegetable beds. Um, fertilizers can be a really good thing to add. Specifically, a lot of times what we see in vegetable beds is nitrogen depletion because there's a lot of vegetables, tomatoes and eggplant and peppers are all very, very heavy feeders of nitrogen. Um, but if you're also adding compost and things like that, you typically, typically can have some pretty healthy soil. But if you start to see like yellowing or specific problems with that, that's where you would consider adding fertilizer or at initial planting of the vegetables to add sort of like a broadcast fertilizer. I just want to make a point here. I know we're going to the next slide, but um, you can do as much damage with fertilizer as you can help with fertilizer. So overdoing it, you can burn and kill all your plants within a week. So just make sure you're following directions. All right, so the last area I wanted to touch on is um, an area that is often uh, maybe not as closely paid attention to. And I think a lot of times it's because it can be such a challenge because it tends to be sort of like the most costly. There's a lot of places where they say, oh, we'll give you, you know, we'll, we'll donate seeds to you and, you know, you can get a soil donation or a compost location, but very few locations are like, hey, here's a bunch of money for some really great seeding or, hey, we'd like to buy you a shade structure. They tend to be kind of like the higher dollar additions, but I will, I want to make the point that I think that this is probably the area in a school garden, which most directly affects the desire of teachers to use that space. Having a space that is a friendly teaching space, if you were bringing out 20 to 25 kids, having that space where it's kind of like a home base and it's familiar to the kids in terms of like sitting and listening to a teacher is very comforting to be able to teach a lesson, especially if you have a dry erase board that you can use or you've got, you know, a place where stuff is stored and you know you don't have to haul a bunch of stuff out there. So I just want to make the point that I think it's very important every year to sort of do an audit of what you have in terms of hardscape. Make sure that your shed is working for you. If the door jams or everyone's forgotten the combination to the lock, that is not working for teachers going out there. It's one more obstacle that they have to overcome. Um, dry erase boards, you know, our, our weather just eats up dry erase boards. It, you know, after about a year, they stop erasing. And I've been in that position where I'm out there and like you can't erase the last thing that was written on there or after your lesson, you can't erase it. You know, you can get a plexiglass board for about maybe like $100. So I think it's worth it to make that a teaching space. I don't think we would put up with it inside a school to have a dry erase board that you literally couldn't write on and couldn't erase. So I'm not sure, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for us to put up with it in an outdoor classroom either. Um, I'm gonna skip seating for now because I'm gonna touch on that in a second. Shade structures, again, it's kind of one of those higher priced items and I realize that sometimes districts make it even harder because they say you have to use certain vendors and there are certain restrictions on installing and things like that. But those are the kind of things that pay for themselves over and over and over again in terms of comfort of the teachers and the students using the space. So really just kind of think about it as an element of that space. And if you don't have natural shade, is there something you can do to, to create a space that's where the, we don't have to stop using it for like September, half of October, half of April, and all of May. And then, um, you know, tables are just a nice thing to have out there for either demonstrations by the teacher, or maybe there are like folding tables that can be taken out of the storage area. So, like I said, I think it's a really good idea to kind of audit your hardscape every year. And if you need, have something that needs upgrading or replacement, try to make a plan for that. Figure out where the funding can come from, um, whether it's from district grants or it's from PTA or a fundraiser of some kind. Um, go ahead and try to kind of think about when that will need replacing and where the money comes from. So the next slide, I just wanted to show some seating. So, you know, seating comes in a variety of options, obviously. Um, and before the pandemic, you know, we would look at these and be like, this is fantastic, no problem, benches work great. And I do love, you know, I, I love just showing the different possibilities. Um, River Ridge on the um, left hand most side there, you know, had some amazing volunteers who did these beautiful like wood 
benches and they've, you know, clawed, they've uh, polyurethane them over and, and, you know, try, that's something you have to keep up with. So you just have to make sure that's in your plan. Um, the next one over, you see you've got like cinder blocks paired with lumber. So again, there's some upkeep to that, but those are great to have because it creates that ability to have a class uh, in a teaching situation. So I just wanted to show this last option because um, Laurel Mountain actually last year purchased some of these stools for their outdoor classroom. And this was before the pandemic and everything, but now it's like, I look at that and I go, oh, well now maybe flexibility is a really good option. I wouldn't have really pushed that before, but you know, we taught a lesson at Laurel Mountain where we actually use these as little individual tables. And then obviously students can use them and you can put them in whatever formation is needed. So just kind of consider what's a good investment for your school garden in terms of seating. So something we're gonna be sending you guys in our post email is this annual garden audit sheet. You know, this isn't rocket science, but it's just maybe is something that helps you guys ask the questions about your gardens and has you do that sort of like, let's go through things and see where do we need to prioritize. We're gonna talk about that in a second about like where you prioritize, but really thinking through where are your problem areas, what needs fixing now versus what's gonna take a little planning to raise money and make an investment later on. So again, you'll get this in the post email and we hope it helps to kind of make a plan for you. All right, so questions? We do have a couple. Okay. Um, one is, would you add the mulch before or after planting? Yeah. yeah, so um, so mulch typically, if you're doing transplants, like let's say, you know, in a vegetable garden or perennial transplants where you're putting a plant in, what I would recommend, obviously, if there's mulch already there, you're going to pull the mulch back until you can see the soil, and then you're going to dig your hole. Um, you don't want to plant, like, in the mulch. So then you could just kind of add mulch back around it. But an important distinction is if you were seeding something, so let's say you were like spreading lettuce seed out in a bed, you want that to have direct contact with soil. So you would pull all the mulch back if it's existing or don't put any down, do the seeding. And then once you start having pretty significant plant size, that's when you would put the mulch in so that the mulch doesn't smother the tiny, tiny seedlings. You need those seed seedlings to be big enough so that they're at least going to be above the mulch. So a lot of times during like, you know, winter season, lettuce and stuff like that, it stays pretty small for a while. So you may not add the mulch in until it gets a little bit taller. And then we had a question about sending out the PowerPoint, which we will be doing in the uh, post webinar email. Awesome. All right. Okay, so we have just seen a lot of um, potential problems that you might be facing, challenges that you might have um, in Bonnie's first section. And so we just wanted to highlight quickly some of the problems that we've seen from the photos that you guys have sent in. Um, now, I just want you guys to know there is no shame if your school is highlighted in these pictures about problems. There's no shame because as I was looking through the photo folder, everyone has pretty much the same problems to varying degrees. So if you see your school and you're like, oh no, don't worry about it. Um, also, if you hear squawking in the background, I'm sorry, five month old is on the floor right next to me. Um, <laughs> so the first one of these 99 problems that you might have are weeds. And these are weeds that are growing, when we say weeds, out, it's usually outside of the garden beds. But as you can see in this picture on the left, it might be weeds inside your garden beds as well. Um, and as Bonnie was mentioning, as soon as these weeds go to seed, it's really easy to lose control of them. So in the picture on the right, it might not look that bad. It's like spotty weeds that you think, okay, I could, we could knock that out with a couple volunteers in a couple of hours. But if that's not taken care of quickly, then those seeds will just spread and um, kind of get out of control. The next problem that we saw a lot of in the photos that y'all sent in were overgrown beds. And so Bonnie mentioned this. This is not, this is different from weeds because these are plants that you at one point wanted in these beds and you were really excited about having. And then they've been allowed to go to seed maybe so they could attract pollinators. They've dropped their seeds everywhere. And all of a sudden you have these beds that are so overgrown that in the picture on the right, you can't even see the garden beds um, because of all of the, the overgrown volunteer vegetables that are there. 
Um, again, the one on the picture on the left, it might not look that bad, but remember, it's only going to keep growing and getting more and more out of control. So this is another common problem that we've seen that you, Brett, you guys probably have to address um, as one of your initial steps to getting your gardens ready for the fall. And then the last one that we didn't get as many pictures of, but I think y'all might be, um, might have kind of a common experience with this too, is a seating area that's starting to look a little bit run down. Maybe your um, seating is falling apart. Maybe as in these pictures, you have either volunteer plants or weeds that are kind of overtaking your seating area. Maybe you have a shade structure that's broken or your whiteboard is, um, as you can see in the picture on the left, this whiteboard has probably got some uh, stains on it that might be really difficult to get off. As Bonnie was mentioning, it's really frustrating to go out and try to teach a lesson when you get out there and realize you can't use the whiteboard. Um, so these three main areas are some of the biggest problem areas that are important to tackle right away. And as we're looking through these pictures and as you were listening to Bonnie talk about all the different ways that you can start to make improvements to your garden, um, you might be thinking like, wow, this is a lot of work. <laughs> and so I just wanna ask you that old proverb, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time, right? So when you're thinking about how to prioritize this elephant of restarting your school garden, um, the first kind of bite you should think about or the first step you should take is what is your school garden's biggest challenge? So if you think your school garden's biggest challenge is that there's no seating area, that's what you're gonna try to tackle first. If you think that it's um, volunteer plants that are overtaking the beds, that's what you'll tackle first. If you look at the hardscape and the walking area and it's covered in weeds so tall that the kids couldn't walk through, that's gonna be your biggest challenge. So you have to think about what is the thing in your garden that's gonna create long-term problems that will make the garden unusable in the future. So bite number one is really getting down to it and identifying the garden's biggest challenge. Bite number two is thinking about how much time do we have realistically to tackle this challenge? So, you know, I know that AISD and a couple of other school districts have recently released that they're going online for the first few weeks of school. So maybe you wanna set a deadline that by the time kids come back into school, although that could be fluid depending on what happens with COVID. Um, or maybe you wanna set a deadline that you want to have this garden cleaned up before school even starts because you know that teachers once even online classes start are gonna be so busy. Or maybe you don't wanna prioritize this until you get into the swing of things and kind of get rolling and you don't wanna start it until October, have a, October as a deadline. As a school, you need to identify what is your deadline and how are you going to meet those different challenges and stay on this deadline? Um, so if you only have a couple of weeks before your students are going to start doing their online classes, then you'll have a shorter timeline. If you want to wait a little bit longer, again, the longer you wait, the more out of control things will get. But if that works for your team, then maybe you'll have a little bit more time. So just kind of think about setting a deadline and then working backwards to make a timeline to address these big challenges. And then the third bite or the third step of eating this big elephant of garden maintenance is how do you manage garden maintenance during COVID? Because usually we would encourage y'all to set up some kind of community organization platform and have a big work day and have music playing and provide bottled water and maybe some breakfast and you just knock it all out with 30 volunteers all in one morning. Well, right now during COVID, that is not an option. So next we're gonna go over some, uh, some different ideas for how to get this garden maintenance done and tackle these big challenges and meet your deadlines and still stay safe during the pandemic. So the first restriction that will kind of ultimately affect how you can get this garden maintenance done is social distancing. So that means that we can't have random volunteer groups, like you don't wanna ask a group from a church to all come together or um, a Boy Scout troop to all come together and do a large work day in the garden. So instead, there are some ideas you can do to get people who are in the same bubble or in the same kind of uh, quarantine space to come and work in the garden and help. So uh, we wanna encourage bubble work days. So if you know that there are, there's a family who has a shared bubble with another family next door, they could all come together and work for a morning. Um, or if you know that there's a series of families who would like to come and do that, um, have them come just on a separate morning from one another and have these bubble work days in the mornings. And you can knock out a lot of work if you have consecutive bubble work days. 
Um, another idea is that if you have several families who are excited about the garden and invested in the school, they could adopt an entire week in the garden. So for a week, they could come as frequently as they'd like to, whatever time they'd like to, and they can pull weeds in the morning. They, if there are any plants you want to try to salvage that are intentionally planted and you want them to grow into the school year, like native plants, for example, um, they could water those plants. They can start adding mulch if you have supplies there for them. So a family could take a whole week and do a bunch of work. And then the next week, a new family could come in. Um, whenever you have people coming in and there's not supervision as with a traditional big work day, it's really important, as Bonnie mentioned, to post some kind of a task list or a chore board somewhere where families can see what do I do when I get to the garden? And there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, you can, if you have someone who's on your garden committee who lives near the school, you can have a physical chore board that you post on the outside of the garden uh, shed or even right inside the shed door. Um, but then that requires someone to go to the school frequently and check the progress and physically update the, the physical chore board. So that's one idea if you have someone that lives close and wants to be that invested you know, in that physical space. Another idea for this chore board is to have an online format. So you can send out a document or an Excel spreadsheet that's shared among everyone, all the bubbles, all the families who are helping with your garden maintenance. And as people get things done, they can go off and check these, these things off themselves. And then the next family can see, okay, the weeds in the one L-shaped garden bed were taken care of by the other family, so we're gonna tackle the weeds in this other L-shaped bed. And if you have it either in physical or online, these tour boards can help to prioritize your big challenges so that families know how to direct their energy. Um, it's also really important when you have volunteer groups coming that there's some kind of a perk, some kind of a you know carrot, maybe an actual carrot, well not right now because it's summer, but some kind of a perk that you can give to them so that they'll feel like they're recognized and they'll feel like they're getting something out of it. Um, because let's face it, pulling weeds in August in Texas is hot and hard work. Um, so if you have vegetables that are growing, you can offer them free veggies. Any volunteer who comes can harvest some veggies to take home. Um, if you don't have anything like that growing in your garden, you can also just give them some social media props. So if your school has a page, um, put a, have them take a picture of themselves doing a family work day and then post that on your school's social media, on your Twitter, your Instagram account for your school. Put them up on your classroom website when um, schools start um, posting things uh, to, to those websites again. Um, so definitely give some kind of recognition. And then the other kind of perk that you can use to sell this to a lot of different families is that your kids have been cooped up with you since March. <laughs> and so if you want a little bit of a break, take them to the school garden, especially depending on what school you're at. A lot of these school gardens have a playscape that is not currently being used that's near the garden. So the kids could either be on the playscape while you're working in the garden. If they're a little bit older and they want to help in the garden, kids love to dig in the dirt. Give them a plastic trowel and let them dig and let them pull up nutgrass roots and, you know, give them that physical outside time to get them out of the house and, you know, not cooped up anymore. This is a great way to advertise work days to your different kind of bubble units. The next restriction that some of your schools um, will that you are facing when running volunteers in a garden is the risk of surface spread. So the idea of sharing tools across different bubble groups um, might be a little bit risky. Now keep in mind that as research is coming out, um, it's looking like it's less and less likely that um, the COVID bacteria or the virus is spreading through surfaces, but it is still a good idea to give at least a 24 hour buffer window before you have people sharing tools. Um, so a couple ways to work around this to encourage garden work days. Families might have personal gardening tools, so you can encourage them to bring their own tools. And if they are gonna share the school tools that are in the shed, um, make sure that you have a plan posted somewhere near your chore board or online for sanitizing those shared surfaces after the work is done. So this includes the handle of the shed, the lockbox if you want the families to get in and out of the shed, and the key, the hose and the hose nozzle, um, uh, any kind of seating, if they're gonna be sitting down and kind of touching the seating or having their kids sit on the benches, um, trowels, 
clippers, anything that families are using, just have a plan posted for how to sanitize. And this can be really simple. It can be, you might have a bottle of sanitizing spray in the shed. So it can just be spray off the tools, wipe them down, or use a little hand sanitizer on a paper towel and wipe things down. Um, and at that point, um, after you've sanitized, it's still nice to wait for at least 24 hours before another group comes in. But one more kind of shared surface that we should look at is gloves. So because gloves are made of cloth, it's not easy to just like spray them with the sanitizing spray and wipe them down, obviously. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could manage this. If you wanted to have a bin or a bag where people put their used gloves and then once a week, someone from the school can come and either wash them or lay them out in the sun to solarize them for a few hours and then put them in the clean pile. You can manage it that way. You can have people share gloves, uh, or sorry, bring their own gloves and not share gloves at all. Um, or if you wanna just have people use those gloves, um, it's, you need to have a sign posted somewhere saying, you know, use at your own risk, these are shared gloves. So just awareness about anything that's being touched that's a common surface. Um, the other thing that's important is if you're going to use the model of having different bubble kind of groups come and do work days, um, try to space them out at least 24 hours apart. So don't have someone from different bubbles coming on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, have a group come on Monday, and then a group come on Wednesday, and then a group come on Friday. So as you're thinking about how to get these bubble units signed up to help in the garden, um, something like Sign Up Genius can be a really good tool for making sure that people are spaced out and they're not just going to be right on top of each other back to back um, because we want to minimize these shared surfaces and just give things time to air off uh, before you have another group coming in. The last main restriction you might find um, because of these COVID restrictions when you're trying to set up garden work days is that your school, either the garden or the entire grounds might be locked. Um, because our schools have been closed for so long, this is one reason why some of the gardens are looking so rough because these areas have been locked off in some cases. So the first step in addressing this big challenge is to check in with your admin team right away. Like even if you're not planning on having your first set of volunteers come in until mid-August or later, um, check in with them now and start figuring out how do we get around things like locked gates or restricted grounds? How do we let these people into the garden so that we can start cleaning it up? It's also important that you have an email from the administrator that says, yes, it's all right for volunteers to be in the garden and clean things up, that you can then forward on to your volunteer groups. I know at McBee, because it's right next to a busy road, um, we've had students from UT who in the early part of the pandemic were at the garden doing work days and the police actually pulled up and they said, what are you guys doing here? Are you supposed to be here? And they had an email from the principal and they pulled it up on their phone and they said, yes, here's our permission. And then the police left. So, you know, it's just really important because everyone's being so cautious, especially about these public spaces that have been locked for so long that, that your volunteers have some kind of permission to be there so that we're not getting anyone in trouble. Um, when you talk to your admin about using these shared spaces, it's important to think about the cost versus the benefits of letting volunteers in. So your admin team might be very, very resistant to letting people in, especially right before students come back to schools if that does end up happening in the fall. Um, so if they're reluctant, kind of outline, one of the biggest costs for keeping people out is that the garden can get out of control. It might already be out of control. And if you don't get extra people in to help, then it's only going to get worse. And it can be a huge eyesore and a huge amount of work the longer you let it sit. That's one of the biggest costs. Um, another kind of uh, concern that your admin might have that you'll need to address is safety concerns. And that's why I went over all of those different tips that you can outline, you can make a plan for how are we gonna keep our volunteers safe? You know, we're gonna minimize shared surfaces, we're not gonna let people be there at the same time who aren't in the same bubble. So you can address that with your admin and say, we have a plan to make sure that everyone is safe. And that most importantly, if kids come back to campus, that they're also gonna be safe when they're back on campus. Um, and the last thing, kind of a benefit that you can share with your admin of why it's important besides keeping the garden under control is that schools are such a, a community catalyst and we haven't been able to have things like, um, you know, PTA fundraiser nights or catch nights or school concerts or 
um, you know, graduation ceremonies, that we haven't been able to have any of those things since this whole thing started. So even letting people come in in their own little bubble will give them that sense of community involvement and working towards something like the health of the garden and the school that can start to build up some more of that community feeling of support around the school that people have been missing for so long. So these are just some tips for what you can talk about when you email or call your admin to ask about permission and to set up a system for letting volunteers into the grounds. All right, so those are some kind of quick and dirty tips for how to address the problems of garden maintenance during the time of COVID. Uh, do we have any questions about this so far? No specific questions about that, but they do have questions about a few other things. Um, do we need to leave any space around the base of the plants when mulching? And I can answer if you want. I don't know. Yeah, Bonnie, do you want to answer that since that was in your Yourself. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, yeah, there's no real reason um, to leave space around the base of the plant unless you just, unless it's so small that you might just want to leave a little bit. But normally, no, you would just actually bring mulch right up to it. And in fact, a lot of times that inhibits little cutworms and stuff from actually going across and just slicing through the stem. So yeah, that's fine. No space. Uh, and then they were asking for recommendations for buying materials and supplies. So, you know, soil compost mulch. Plants. Yeah, I thought some of those great recommendations that a couple people were mentioning. And um, also I'll just mention, somebody mentioned like Geo Growers, I think down in Dripping Springs offers a discount. Um, Round Rock Gardens gives a 25% discount to Round Rock ISD schools. I know Georgetown, um, their municipal area, you can contact them and get like mulch. Um, and then I would also, um, recommend that everyone is is registered with the Sustainable Food Center resource giveaway. Um, they do like a giveaway day and they do seeds and compost and all this stuff, but only if you're kind of signed up and registered as a school garden. So definitely go on and it doesn't matter if you're in Austin or not. So go ahead and make sure your school garden is registered on there and then they'll contact you as it gets close to the resource giveaway day. Mm -hmm. Um, I also saw the question about, um, is there anything that you can recommend that we could spray on weeds to help a little bit? Um, okay, so my official answer is that um, you are not allowed to apply herbicides in your garden. That is a job that is only allowed for district professionals who have that license to apply herbicide. Um, and that's for safety reasons, obviously. So uh, one thing I will mention is that there, you know, a couple of people have asked about like horticultural vinegar is like a very, very strong vinegar that you can buy at a lot of gardening stores and that you can spray on weeds that will like burn the weeds. I, I wouldn't say it's like a magic, like, oh, that worked fantastic. You know, it's so I'm not sure it's worth your time or money. It ends up being that kind of like this, the balance of safety and the balance of effectiveness ends up being actually like just pulling out the weeds. Sorry, I wish I could give like the magic answer to say here is the answer to all your prayers. But All right, I think that is all the questions we have for now. So we'll move on and it's going to be a really fun part. We're going to do some breakout rooms. Um, so I have put y'all into breakout rooms based on the email that you sent um, with your school buddies. So if I know that there, we had more people signed up than are actually here. So if you end up being in a room and none of your other colleagues are with you, send me a message and I'll put you in a room with a group. So I think everybody had multiple people at their schools except for um, Mitchell and Overton who will be together. And then Nidig, Elgin, and Voigt, who will also be together because um, they all only had one, one person. So in these breakout rooms, we're going to spend eight minutes uh, talking about some goals that we're going to make. Um, and I know I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with SMART goals. So we thought that was a good thing for teachers um, to look at for your school garden. So these are really goals about your physical school garden. So not necessarily the program that you have at your school. Um, just really the physical space that you're trying to get ready for the school year. And then we want to know what are your goals? How will you do this? And when will you do this? So that's kind of where the different um, aspects of SMART come in. So if y'all can assign maybe a, a note taker 
to write some things down. We'll come back in about eight minutes and we'll share these different ideas and hopefully that will be helpful for other schools to hear what everybody else is planning. Sound good? Any questions about that? Okay, here we go. Let's see how, let's see what happens. Oh, uh, I hope that everyone, I hope you all had enough time to chat. I think what we're going to do is just sort of popcorn share. So whoever, whatever school or group wants to share first, that's great. Um, Y'all can share. And then as we go, try not to repeat any ideas that have been said, unless it's like, you know, something kind of building off of that. Um, but we'd like to, Michelle's going to have a whiteboard up and we're going to be writing down all of your ideas um, and goals and then just kind of move forward from there and and we'll keep it going for a little bit and then move on to the next thing. So whoever wants to go first, whoever is the designee. We can, we can go first. All right. Um, ours is River Ridge and we are located in Leander, but we are in Austin, Texas by Steiner Ranch, in Steiner Ranch. Um, so we're Travis County. Um, so we identified, um, some problems that we kind of needed to kind of get together first before we can um, actually kind of move forward and then kind of some steps of when to do that. So one of the things that um, we are looking at is we don't really have trash cans or we don't know if we have trash cans and how those are manned and how we can um, make sure that um, they, the teachers were told that the bees could get into the trash cans and things like that. So we want to know about how we can be able to like discard things. And um, we also have a really great shed that um, has a lock that not all of us had access to. And so we are wanting to make that um, an easier access because if teachers have the access, then they're going to be able to know what's inside of it. Um, and another big thing that we need to get done is just an inventory list so that everybody knows what is in that shed that we could be able to use. And then we have some great tables out there, but, um, and great seating um, around them, but also we don't have any just standing tables so that kids can work around those tables. Okay. And how, um, and how many we have access to and how we can be able to, um, you know, keep those to where kids could be able to work on that harder surface instead of our picnic tables that are out there that have kind of holes in them and not as great of a, um, a place for them to be able to work on. Um, and then just incorporating um, the units of study and the things that we are, um, that really relate to the garden and um, and having a plan for that. And then another thing that we're really gonna work on is being able to advertise our need for, for this cleanup time and families to be able to do that. So I would say we know we need to meet again and we kind of committed to meeting once a month for sure as a garden um, committee and then also adding um, some of the PTA that funds a lot of our garden in, into that meeting as well. So that's kind of where we got. I think that's awesome. That's really great. And y'all can use those different things to sort of formulate goals at your first meeting. That's a great thing to do, you know, to start thinking about at your meeting since it probably looks a little different this year, you know, getting access and those kind of things. So it sounds like y'all had a fruitful conversation. Hey, Michelle, are you typing? Oh, Henry can go next. I was just going to start typing some, so, Jen, you shared some like very specific goals for your school. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to think about what to share with the group that's going to be really helpful. And I was just going to start writing. Can you guys see this? All the writing? Yeah, I was going to say, I feel, I feel like um, that, Jen, that Jennifer was um, like fo focusing really good, fo focusing really well on some hardscape stuff that maybe was going to be like take a little longer to like work with the school, like trash cans and, you know, like lock changes or things like that. And then, you know, also focused on maybe the support structures like the committee making sure that meetings are set and there's sort of like a plan for how that's going to work. And involving your PTA is great. Yeah. Who said they could go next? I heard somebody pop oh, up. Henry. Henry. 
Uh, well, we talked um, a little bit. We have some raised beds outside that uh, the community can access. Um, so it would be nice to get one of those chalkboards with a, a task list since we're in central Austin in Travis. And so we're like right in the middle of a, a little a neighborhood, basically. Um, but one of our, our main SMART goals was to pull weeds because we know that's going to take take some time and we actually the, uh, the three of us were, were going to actually meet up Sunday just to take a look at our gardens but uh, we also want to spread soil and mulch out and weed those gardens so that's like kind of our attainable goal before before school starts hopefully to just kind of tackle those um, raised beds we also have a garden interior garden a butterfly garden um, in our courtyard, courtyard, but we can't really access that at the moment. But like you had, uh, like Michelle had mentioned earlier, we need to contact admin now, you know, and say, hey, how can we get in? How can we get people in as well? Um, that's more of our smart goal on just the basics, but um, we also eventually want to add some more raised beds um, and we want to get our compost areas in check because they're kind of all over the place and we want to maintain those a little bit better too so yeah that's those are great those are great things and they all seem you know attainable in before school probably or you know, at the beginning of the school year too yes definitely um so thank you yeah thanks for sharing anyone like to go next Hi, um, Annie Pearl. This is Amy. I can go next. Um, we also talked about doing our weeding and setting up a schedule so that maybe we're each in charge of a section of rotating around. We talked about trying to figure out our fall seeds. Um, we weren't sure if the Sustainable Food Center was going to be doing another handout in fall or if we're going to look for local resources. Setting up the sanitizing station inside the shed and setting up a chalkboard or something we can have our task list on in case we're remote for longer. So we can have that running for volunteers and then uh, figure out more free, free resources and grants and our budget. Mm -hmm. You all have a lot to talk about at your first, at your first meeting for sure. I love that idea of having a section for weeding in the gardens for, you know, each person to sort of be in charge of. And that doesn't mean that you have to only do the weeding yourself, but you can at least like, this is a section I'm in charge of and, you know, people can help with it, families or whatever or whatever so that's that's a good idea um okay um i'm from carver mostly what we noticed because some of our pictures showed up there was the, <laughs> the overgrown um fennel of course and then the weeds are just taken over the seating area mm -hmm. and so that's something that we've got to um get on is the the weeds and the some of the overgrown plants yeah plus one of the pictures you showed with the cinder block benches with the wood built over the cinder blocks we really liked those so that's something we'd like to replace our um, stumps with is maybe make a goal for that towards uh, mid-year that we could have those done and out there in the seating area um, most everything else that's on there are some things that we also need, but um, I seem to remember that we were supposed to get some kind of a composter, but I don't think that ever happened. So that's something that we need to do also, um, is have a better composting area for our garden. Yeah, and especially at the beginning of the year where it's maybe, you know, even though, um, I mean, I know a lot of times at the beginning of the year, there's sort of like wish lists that are put out. And so being able to kind of have that garden wish list, I always felt like when I was doing, uh, when I was personally like managing a garden, a lot of times you get the stuff that you're not necessarily sure you want. And so being able to kind of have that list of like parents, if you'd like to contribute something, or if you have a used one of these, like here's sort of like what we need versus like giving us the, you know, old, you know, whatever, uh, bird bath or something that you no longer want that's like chipped on one side or something. Yeah. I've also seen, I don't know if y'all have buy nothing groups on Facebook in your neighborhoods, but if you don't get on it because it's great. And I've seen people give away composting bins and different kind of like tools and supplies and materials. So that's, that's a really cool way to get things for free that other people don't want. Just a tidbit. 
Thanks for sharing though. Um, okay, anybody else? Hi, this is Jana from Casey. Hello. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, pretty much the same things, uh, setting up a meeting to definitely try to create a work day. We are gonna do like a sectioned off little work day so that everyone, you know, it's, all, it's very, very minimal uh, how many people will sign up and they'll kind of just be focused on their one section and then, you know, we'll keep social distancing and then, you know, go home. We did like the bubbled groups. Uh, we're gonna try to change it out because we've had some of the same volunteers come over the summer. So trying to get new people in and give those people a break. Um, we new composting bin we also talked about that we talked about planning schedule we do want to keep some of our seating as of right now we have the stumps but then we also talked about possibly upgrading to better seating and um, i need to email about the sustainability and just kind of la a laundry list of things that need to get done <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know, I'd recommend as well that, um, you know, hearing you talking about communicating with, you know, people and starting like work days. I mean, as a parent, I know, like, I see a lot of questions right now to, sc to schools of like, well, can parents come in and help? Like, they, you know, they want to help so bad. And so being able to offer up like parent involvement in a garden as that, you know, kind of community connection. Um, I think it's sort of like one small area where they, you can say like, yes, we would love to have you help. Like if you're wondering how you can, you know, kind of keep our school going strong, this is an area. So hopefully that will tie into some parent passions and, and where they're not normally they can't go in the building, you know, so using them for your benefit in the garden. Yeah. Thank you. Right. That's a great suggestion. <laughs> can't see my face. Um, okay, so I'm Sarah and I'm from Caraway. Um, some of the things, I mean, we talked about all of the things that a lot of people have listed. Um, this is going to be our first year, like the garden was just built last year, so this is kind of our first year doing this as a campus. Mm -hmm. um, so our big thing is we're going to do a needs assessment because we need to do a full inventory of our tools and we need to kind of all get on the same page. Um, we've talked about setting up a meeting before school starts and before teachers go back because once August 10th hits for Round Rock, like we're gonna be into Schoology and really needing to focus on that. So we wanna kind of get this going before then. And then we talked about, um, we did have a question. Um, we have vegetable garden pr primarily and some of our tomato plants are doing great. They're still producing fruit. But we know at some point between now and like September, October, we're probably going to want to pull those plants and get it ready for a winter garden. And we're not entirely sure what timeline should look like, um, like when we should be pulling those plants and like what things y'all would recommend doing with that. And then we also talked about the possibility of talking to the PTA about getting one of the Wi-Fi connected game cameras so that while students are at home virtually learning, they can kind of see our garden in real time and really engage and interact with that environment. And it would also give parents and volunteers the opportunity to have that celebrity status by being on the game camera and being seen. Those are so fun. I love the I love the idea of a needs assessment. I think that's super important, and that's similar to the garden audit that we talked about before. Um, just looking at those different areas in which you, you know you can have improvements or things that are going well. Um, that's really cool. And then having that camera would be awesome. How excited would kiddos be to see themselves and families Great. at the garden? That is so, that is, yeah, I love that. And we are going to talk, um, we're, we have a slide coming up actually, just about um, timeline for like, when do you pull things? So hold, hold your horses, we'll definitely get to that. Yep, it's coming up. All right, anyone else? Um, can you hear me? Yes, Jen. Oh, sorry. I can't see my face, so I'm never, I don't understand this. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, I'm looking at the camera. Um, I'm Jen Turner. I, um, I'm at Voight Elementary in Round Rock. Um, we've had our garden for a couple years. Um, 
Bonnie's been awesome. And I thought it was really funny, Bonnie, that you said that you don't like to get rid of plants when they're too big, because you're the one who made me pull up everything last year. So, <laughs> but I, I, it's her own plants. Yeah. <laughs> it was really funny, because I was like, she's like, you have to pull it up, you have to pull it up. But no, she's right. Um, so we, we backed away. We usually have monthly work dates. And so pretty much all the ones for the spring that we had set, we had to cancel. Um, we have had people like our core crew, like of volunteers that go, um, but they've all been texting me the past like couple weeks, like, hey, we really need to get out there. So we are actually, um, like our next step is that we are going to, like, just like the five people that really regularly come up, we're going to meet there Saturday separated, um, just to kind of go over like a plan, because um, they don't all have like technology. Um, and it's going to rain. So we're excited about that. We're going to get some weeding done, but I like the idea of um, like market, marking the areas. So one thing I want to make sure we do on Saturday is I want to get their input and be like, okay, like we can get like sign markers and be like, okay, this is weeding area one, this is weeding area two. And so we can assign those areas. And I think that would be a really good way for us to um, kind of get back on the horse. Um, Cause we we're used to doing it like one Saturday a month all together. It's very like, communal and so since we can't do that um like we're less likely to show up when it's really hot if we don't have people there to talk to but i think if we have that one area that we can be like okay we're just gonna go work on this area and like you'll have that sense of ownership so i definitely want to like market the the different sections of the garden to focus on um and our we are working on getting a new shade structure we still have like the poles but um and I know some of our volunteers have talked about us finding like some other kind of material. So we need to like figure out how to get that set up, even if just for the volunteers to have a shady place to sit. Um, I think that's going to be important for their well-being because it's hot through October. Um, so yeah, we just need to kind of find a way, a maintenance schedule that's going to work for us now that we can't do what we've done in the past that's been successful. Um, yeah, and Jen, I was going to tell, I was going to just add in, you know, Void and a couple of other schools, like if you're in a situation where your your school is in a very walkable neighborhood like your students and their families tend to live close by you know obviously like that might work, work really well with a situation of having like you know offering up to families to kind of come up and do like a little family work day or a bubble work day so i think a couple i think of having them labeled really well yeah like like, we'll have like one of those like those little like foam things and it's like okay go to bed like number one and that way they know just to focus on that and I like the PowerPoint, the three pictures. Um, like we had talked about doing it with our tech person that like on our daily news, we were gonna start doing garden videos once a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know when we go on Saturday, I talked to like Mr. Williams and some people, but we wanna like maybe be like, oh, this is what this week, like if you see it in your yard, like things like that. And so maybe once a week we have these garden videos that teachers can share live with their students. And I mean, some of, a lot of our kids live in apartments, but a lot of them do live in these duplexes. And so like, they might be able to go out and see some of these things. Um, so that's a perfect try to like work on that part. We're going to talk about that too in a little bit, but that's a great way to build interest and um, excitement around the garden when, you know, kids maybe can't be there or won't be there for a little while. So I like that idea too. Anyone else? <laughs> Um, Katie, can you next? repeat that last idea that you just said you really liked and I'll add it. Oh, um, yeah. She was talking about having little videos like for students. They involved their tech team at, um, at the school to have little videos they could send out, the teachers could send out to their kids about maybe like the weeds that they're seeing or things that are going on at the garden. Short little clips. So um, I will be talking about Heart uh, Elementary. And um, our, so two teachers are uh, taking the training with you all today. So we uh, discussed, um, uh, you know, things from the past and we focused that as a goal, uh, we would like to, um, uh, I guess, establish who our current um, um, garden committee members are. And then from there, uh, focus on, um, cleaning out our current uh, garden um, uh, area, first things first. So in the past, there's been one teacher from every grade level um, in, involved in, uh, in with gardening. 
So we just want, you know, but as the T as the year ends, you know, teachers move away, teachers join campuses. So um, we we are trying to start that um, early on so that we get um, the members and the uh, the garden area clean uh, throughout the fall. And of course, you know, it's an attainable goal um, once uh, admin approves it. And um, it is extremely relevant because um, once this is done, then we can push um, other other ideas and projects uh, in mind. So um, one way that we were uh, thinking is um, um, sending out um, like a, a Google form to collect um, those colleagues who are interested and uh, we can always have our uh, meetings virtually. Um, again, involving administration to have the okay. And, um, and then um, definitely the timeline would be by spring, this would all be done. So, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of unknown factors as far as like when we'll be allowed, when we will come back to um, the actual campus. But I think that by spring, that's, that's a, a pretty solid uh, deadline. So that's uh, what we have. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a good timeline to move forward with. Thank you. What schools have not gone? Let's see if I can call you out a little bit. Um, uh, I'm Caitlin. We're from Laurel Mountain. Um, so we kind of, I mean, we talked about a lot of the things you guys said already, but um, for us, like all of us that are kind of participating in this um, are novice. So we don't really know a lot about gardening. And traditionally, like we've kind of had, you know, the fourth grade team has kind of like taken over the garden. And so we're talking about, you know, now that we're kind of restructuring this and a lot of the teachers that did that have left um, mm -hmm. or like kind of overwhelmed by the garden, you know, how do we restructure it like as a school? So like, what goals do we want as a school um, to make it more of a community-based garden? And then kind of like, you know, um, assigning either just like grade level tasks or um, uh, even just expanding our, our garden in order to make it like, so each grade level can have like a raised bed that they're in charge of. Um, that way we can align it better to like the teaks for that grade level. Um, so our first goal really is just kind of like, you know, go back, assess what we have, um, what damage the summer has done, and then just kind of reestablishing like either our school goal or like grade level goals for, you know, what we want to use it for. And then just kind of going from there. Yeah, I think that's awesome. That's a good, that's a good way to break up goals and kind of make them more attainable for different levels of teaching. Thank you. Didn't forget that I was muted. Caitlin, I would add that um, it's a great idea to think about how those teaks, you know, relate to the garden at each grade level. Um, I would just caution, don't necessarily um, divvy up the garden so much that it becomes like small little fiefdoms. It's almost easier to say, how do we want to, like, what features do we want in the garden that are available that touch on our teaks? but then the garden is sort of like accessible to everyone, but then we know that the features in the garden work towards teaching the teaks. So sometimes we just find that like when you divvy it up too much, it's like people start to feel or they get the message that, oh, first grade can only use this part or second grade can only use this part. But I think you're right in thinking about what are we teaching and what do we need in the garden to be able to teach that lesson outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, one of the things we talked about, which is why I kind of said, you know, dividing it up was, you know, because it's primarily like run by fourth grade right now, um, you know, like the first grade team was like, well, we want to go out and use the garden, but we don't know what they're doing and we don't want to step on anyone's like toes. And, you know, so just kind of being like, okay, how do we, you know, have some accountability for each grade level so that they feel like they're a part of it. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of making it more uh, like a cohesive, like what's our school goal? And then maybe like uh, if there's, you know, specific grade level teaks that could be incorporated within to that, like maybe they can take the lead on that or something. Um, yeah. Or just even ability level, you know, fifth grade versus first grade, um, they might be able to, you know, well, obviously can do a little bit more in terms of maintenance and stuff. So, um, yeah. but yeah, just kind of figuring that out. <laughs> Do we have anyone else that's any other schools that wanted to contribute anything? I'll talk. Um, I'm from Mitchell and um, it really, truly 
the, I, I, I mean, everything there is what we've kind of talked about in my, but for me, um, I know the biggest goal is just to kind of get the volunteers. That's, um, my goal. I mean, I don't have much to contribute, but I just wanted to say that this is so much and <laughs> it's just good to hear a lot of different ideas. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty, like do all these things, right? These are just different things you could look at or consider for your garden or take to your GLC or your committee meeting or anything like that so that so that you have some ideas on where y'all want to go and what kind of goals you want to make. Yeah, and those of you who have worked with me before know that I've said like a lot of schools, I mean, schools are not, you know, you're not what works for one school is not going to work for every school. So a lot of times, like you'll hear me say something about like, just throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And if it doesn't work, then change it up, right? And so just keep kind of trying things, modifying them to find the thing that works well for your community, your kind of school structure, your teachers, all that kind of stuff. Are we missing anything? Does anyone have anything else? Sorry, I think I just lost the whiteboard. I'm gonna try to go back to it, but. No, we can see it. Oh, you can. I can't see it anymore. <laughs> but I'm glad you guys can. All right. Well, we might be at the end of it anyway, unless anyone has anything to add. Yeah, sounds like so. Okay. All right. Well, um, moving on, we will be talking about steps for fall prep. So we just talked about a lot of those things. Obviously, y'all just talked about it. Um, watch out for deer, you know. <laughs> could come into your garden and um i think a lot of you a lot of y'all probably have different kind of bugs and animals and critter yeah critters is a good word uh okay so steps for the fall obviously we've talked a lot about weeds we all know that that is true get your weeds in check um one thing that i know we just snakes yes jennifer passy just said snakes scary um Pruning your native and herb beds, so uh, some of those ones that maybe have the plants have overgrown, pruning them back, cutting them back, um, getting them into, into shape is great. And then we talked about mulch too, so adding a little bit of mulch if the top layer seems a little thin. Uh, and then clearing out your vegetable beds, which we've talked about as well, which will be great to get ready for, for fall planting. And we'll talk about the timeline next. Um, but if things are still producing, you know, you can leave them in there for a little while, um, probably, you know, tomatoes and peppers and things like that. And then thirdly, funding, which I know a lot of y'all mentioned in wanting different supplies or materials, um, looking for funds. There are some grant apps due in the next few weeks and district funds as well. Um, and then working with, you know, your principal, other admin um, and PTA to help identify other funding sources or seeing what the budget is this year. And maybe some of y'all know what the budget is, um, but if there is one for the garden as well, so you can make some of those dreams come true, like new seating and shade structures and all the fun things. Uh, so this is what was requested. What, when do I plant? Well, we're gonna tell you. So in August, you could plant some things. You can do some planting for a few warm season things, cucumbers, squash, and peppers. These are not seeds. These are starters, um, the little seedlings, just to clarify. Um, but they need to, you know, have a shorter period of time that they're going to produce fruit because otherwise they'll run into the cooler season. Um, and then cutting back the tomato plants by half. So you know how maybe y'all don't know, but a lot of times tomato plants can get real big and crazy. Um, so you can cut those back and then uh, they might still be producing some fruit. Uh, and then in September, more weeding, weeding everywhere. If you see on this chart, there's lots of weeding. So just, I won't go over that again. Um, and then lightly cutting back your perennials um, to clean up. So if the ends are kind of burnt or just looking a little haggard, you can clean those up a little bit to make them look nice and pretty for the school year. Um, October is a fun month. It's exciting because it cools down. I love October. It's really one of my favorite months. Um, you can clean out all your warm season vegetables. You can put some more garden soil and compost in there and you can start planting cool season. So um, perennials for sure, 
wildflower seeds and some great vegetables. We have, there's a really awesome chart from A&M that shows you when to plant certain plants. Um, it is super helpful. I reference it a lot and we can make sure y'all have a copy of that and can share it with you. So you can just look at it and see and make a plan with your garden committee about, you know, when do I, what do we want to plant? Like there's a lot of options in the fall for cool season. So you can decide what your priorities are. And then in November, um, you can do some more planting, which is lucky. We live in Texas, so it's pretty awesome that we can even plant and grow in November and more perennials as well. And just to touch on between October and November, you know, with a lot of the cool season vegetables like radishes and things like that, you can actually do some sequential planting. So you plant, you know, some in one month and then like a month later, plant more so that you don't end up having like all your radishes come in at exactly the same time. Oh, that's a good tip. That is smart. That is what I did not do this summer. And then I had 1 million tomatoes at once. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so virtual learning in the garden. I know y'all touched on some of this too. Um, we want to think of this time as an opportunity, not a challenge, because we know it is challenging enough. Um, but we would like to create more, you know, we, we think y'all want to, you mentioned it in your pre-survey about creating more community through the garden. So um, encouraging your students to be garden detectives in their yards, anywhere, anywhere at a park nearby, you know, they could be doing that a lot of different places. If they are able to come to the garden, then great. They can be a garden detective there. Um, there's, you know, family garden adoption. They could adopt a garden for the week and be in charge of it. They can take anything that's ready to harvest. They can water, they can weed, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I forget which school it was, but they were talking about having that little camera or doing videos. Um, and so planting something and giving updates on it to see how it's growing, to see how it's doing, um, and then showing it, you know, when it's in full fruit and, um, picking it and then chopping it up. So you could give little updates kind of as into real food on your plate. Um, we have, we're going to be sending out an email with some online, just some online resources that we think are helpful, not a ton of resources, just some ones that we, we think might be good, short little videos and activities. Um, but right now we wanted to show you these really cool backyard bug videos, just one of them. Sorry for the sound, it's kind of low, but just, Put your ear really close to the speaker. So these videos are done by the entomologist at the Texas A&M AgriLife, Wizzy Brown. Some of you guys might um, kind of, her name might sound familiar, but she does these little like maybe, you know, 45 second videos. They're on her Instagram account, which is Urban IPM. And she calls it her backyard bug hunt. hunt. And she, there's actually like a whole near, um, whole audio that goes with this. It's not playing right now. But she explains exactly what type of bug, how she's identifying it, and what's happening with it. So here she's talking about, oh, you can see the pollens all over the face. You can see how the bug, how this bee is carrying pollen on its legs. So those are really fun things that might be something you're sharing with the kids. Um, again, to kind of introduce like a backyard kind of garden detective concept or something like that. But also gives you a good sense of how much information that you can kind of convey um, in you know a very short video dealing with the outside as you're connecting all the outdoors that the kids are interacting with, probably at their homes. And then, you know, where you are sort of creating like a, a community hub of these outdoor spaces. Yeah, thanks Bonnie. Um, so we know that y'all know how to use Zoom because you're all here. <laughs> So, and you know how to do virtual stuff because you're forced to do it in this spring. So keeping your garden committee going is possible. And we really want to encourage that, that you can do it and it can be successful. So setting, and I know some of y'all mentioned this too in the, um, when we were talking after the breakout meetings, that setting schedule me scheduled meetings is really helpful. So just planning those out for the fall, you know, once a month or whatever you want to do every other week. Um, and then having an agenda and goals for each meeting will be super important just to keep y'all on track and so that you know kind of what you're accomplishing in that period of time that you have together, um, especially if it's short. And then really talking about establishing new priorities and goals. Um, that'll be important since this year looks so different and is so unknown, but kind of figuring out what are, what are your goals this year for your program? What are your goals for your garden? Um, how do we continue outdoor learning virtually? And 
you know, some of you that are in the different UT programs, obviously that will, you'll be fostering that a little bit with us, but, um, and the, I think, I hope the resources will help that we send as well. And then uh, sending a link once a month out to teachers that can, they can send them to their students for an online resource or a lesson or activity, one of the bug hunts, just something fun to kind of get kids connected to nature and maybe see what's going on in their own school garden. Um, and so y'all as, you know, advocates for the garden, as, as leaders, as members of the garden committees can kind of be the ones that are um, inspiring the other teachers to experience that virtually. Uh, and then we are going to talk about the Austin School Garden Report in a second on the next slide. Here it is. So some of y'all probably filled this out for us. It was a long evaluation of your school garden. I'm sure you did. You can just raise your hand in the air. Um, it was very helpful. Thank you. We're very glad that you gave us so much really rich information about your school garden program, um, things that you're doing, how you're taking your kids out there. We have a lot of results and those will be coming out soon. We'll also still be sending out the survey um, this next year and hopefully continuing for years to come to continue getting uh, a lot of data and information to then help you with your gardens. What, what does a successful garden look like? What are the factors that um, are influencing that in the future? So there will be emails coming out to you. Um, if you're involved in either one of our programs, you'll definitely get that uh, probably late August. And then if you're not, we'll still send it out to you. So we would love your feedback on that. Um, a couple, a few of the results are maybe not surprisingly, administrative support increases um, the likelihood of having a thriving garden by 12 times. So that is a huge increase. Um, the garden coordinator is 20% more. So having a garden coordinator, and that doesn't mean a separate paid person. That just means someone who is able to kind of coordinate what's going on in the garden, maybe um, helping with a calendar. And I think that could be more than one person. I don't think it has to be just one person, but some kind of garden coordination going on um, is huge. Teacher training, which you're doing right now, so way to go, uh, increases a thriving garden by five times. Having garden curriculum as well, uh, five times the garden committees, so they definitely matter. They are very important um, to have. They are greater than a fourfold increase in having a thriving garden, in predicting a thriving garden. And then adequate funding was not as high as we would have expected. We, we kind of thought maybe it would be a little bit higher, but it, it is actually a little bit lower. So really support and interest um, and involvement is, is really big in, in your garden looking amazing. Okay. I just wanted to share a quick comment. Um, when you guys are thinking about emailing your administrators um, to ask about access to the gardens and cleaning up the gardens, you can absolutely reference the statistic that having administrator support is really um, a huge part of the long-term sustainability of a garden and the likelihood of teachers and classes using the garden. So just kind of, you know, we're sharing these statistics with you so that you can use them. Yeah, and we will send that report out and we would love if you'd share it with, you know, your principals and your district and everybody, share it with everybody because we want outdoor learning to be the norm. That would be great. Uh, okay, so a lot of you are a part of the UT School Garden programs or know about them. Um, we have the Sprouting Teachers Program, which Bonnie and I are a part of. Um, the, we really like to, the goal is really to integrate the outdoor classroom into the curriculum. So um, we want school gardens to be thriving. We want teachers to be using them. Um, we want teachers to get confidence in being able to go out and teach in the garden. That's really what we're trying to do. So um, we work with individual teachers and grade levels to just help with their curriculum, help with their confidence. Um, and that's a year long program. Bonnie, do you have anything else to say about that? No? Nope. Okay. And then Michelle will talk about the UT intern program. Yeah, so the other program that we run as kind of part of this UT school garden support team that we're on is the UT intern and preceptor program. Some of you may have been preceptors. Uh, last year was the first year of this program. Um, and some of you 
for this coming year may have been selected as preceptors or you might be on the wait list and you'll find out about your status um, in the coming months. Um, but this program is associated with the class at UT and so we have um, nutri nutrition major students who come in as interns and work alongside of you as their preceptor or their mentor and it's a lot of um, kind of shared learning space. So the UT interns are learning from us how to manage a garden and they're learning about horticultural practices. Um, and then they are teaching your students in your classrooms about the same kind of practices, how to incorporate um, a garden, how to incorporate healthy eating choices, which our students know because they're nutrition majors. And then, um, <laughs> bad timing for a cranky baby. And, um, and then in turn, you as the preceptor are kind of teaching our UT students how to uh, teach and how to run a lesson and how to put into practice all of their public health knowledge. Um, so this is a really exciting course. Um, this is happening, a really exciting program. It's happening this year with some modifications. And so if you're in that program, you're going to get more information about the modifications soon. And both of the programs are full for this year. Um, but we will be sending out in the spring uh, applications for next year. So we will be sure to send that to all of your schools and hope that you can apply. And we hope to grow both of these programs. So we only, we only want them to get bigger and to serve more schools. We only have a couple more slides, so hang in there. We are close, close, close to being done. If you are a part of either one of these programs, um, we can't wait to work with you this year. And once your workday is complete, so attending this webinar and then doing your, your cleanup workday for the fall, if you send us some pictures, we will provide you with six bags of mulch, six perennial plants, and three packets of vegetable seeds. So a little perk for getting your gardens ready. And we'll have a pickup time um, probably late September-ish, something like that, um, so that you can do it in time for your fall planting as well. And this is the end. So this is the last slide. Uh, I haven't seen anything else come through in the group chat, but if anyone has a question they'd like to ask out loud, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Um, I'll just tell you real quick what's going to come to your email soon, which is a post webinar survey, which will be short and sweet, but we just want to hear some feedback on what you thought of this, how we could make it better in the future, what was helpful for you. Um, we'll send out your certificates for your credits, the garden audit sheet, and a list of some online resources you can share with your teachers and students for this year virtually. And then we will also send the, the presentation so you can access that. Any, no questions? Y'all you're probably ready to be done. It's on hunger. I, I have a question. I know that um, it looks like, you know, looking at your timeline, you were showing that, you know, there's, a, of course, lots of things that can always be done year round. But it looks like you were recommending, um, like, doing a lot of the prep work between now and uh, it looked like October, November, before you started actually planting new, like, uh, cool, cool weather uh, or cold weather vegetables um, and fruit. So is that the recommendation or, or like I was thinking about like things that would be ready to be harvested about October, November, um, but it looks like your, your recommendation is to wait until there was a different little timeline. Yeah, Austin really has um, <clears throat> sort of two kind of warm seasons. There's the one that, that is initiated in the spring, and then there's sort of this late summer one that you can kind of take advantage of the, the weather in September and early October. So if you are gonna do something where you try to have kind of that second warm season, either you A, have things that have actually survived the summer like tomatoes and you could actually cut them back so they'll have like a flush of growth and can give you some fall tomatoes. Or you could do some very short harvest time plantings in um, late August or September, but you are gonna have to kind of babysit those to make sure they're getting watered regularly obviously because of the heat. So, but you're right, that cool season plantings really should be in October. If you try to put them in before then, they'll typically just fry. Um, and the, the soil temperature, if they're seeds, the soil temperature won't be right for them to germinate. So you need to really wait until like kind of, you know, mid-October for that, for those cool season plantings. And then the, I'll just add really quickly perennials. If you're trying to replace any perennials, Again, trying to put them in like now or in September, 
you're going to have to water them so often that the likelihood is, especially of being in a school garden, they're not going to get enough attention and they're going to fry as they try to acclimate. So when you're putting in perennials, you're dealing with, you know, two months, two months of them um, acclimating to the soil and growing roots in. So really we recommend October is a much better time and even into November is a much better time to do perennial planting. Yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. All right, well, thank you guys so much. And those of you who are gonna be working with, we really look forward to it. And as always, if you feel like you have a follow-up question, we welcome your emails, the emails right there on the bottom. So we hope everyone has a great rest of their week and a fantastic start to the school year. Thank you guys.